Skills Module 5, NG Tube Insertion, Tube Feeding, and Peg Care. I would like to remind you that portions of this presentation are from Chapter 45 in the text and portions are from Chapter 47. Please be reminded to review all chapter objectives as well as the terms in blue. Oral Feeding Assistance with oral feeding. When clients need assistance with eating, it is important to maintain the client's safety, independence, and dignity. Those at risk for, in, for problems with oral feeding include individuals with frequent pneumonia and unexplained weight loss. To assess a patient for dysphagia, and the definition for dysphagia is difficulty swallowing, you need to look to see if the patient has, is coughing before or after eating, if they have pharyngeal pooling, or a change in voice quality after swallowing. The patient populations where you might see difficulty swallowing or dysphagia are those who have suffered CVAs or strokes, Parkinson's disease, and or dementia. Those at risk for aspiration include those having decreased level of levels of alertness, decreased gag reflex or cough reflex, and also those who have difficulty managing saliva. As a nurse, should you assess any of these mention things, it is time to advocate for a referral for the speech therapist. Again, dysphagia, referred to as or refers to difficulty swallowing. This is identified by a speech therapist and several recommendations can be made. First, there's a screening for dysphagia, and during this screening, the therapist may observe a patient at a meal to observe for changes in voice quality, posture and head control, percent of meal consumed, drooling or leakage of liquids or solids, coughing during or after the meal, and choking. Some recommendations that are made after the dysphagia screening could be to elevate the head of the bed 30 minutes prior to eating, Keeping the patient upright, meaning at a 90 degree angle for at least 30 minutes after eating. Head to chin down or the chin tuck position to prevent aspiration when swallowing. If there's weakness in the oral pharyngeal site, you want to place food on, a, on the stronger side to chew. Do not use straws. More frequent chewing and also taking smaller bites. You would recommend that the patient empty their mouth completely before eating more or before as or before nursing assistive personnel offer more food and also to remove food immediately if there are signs or symptoms that the patient is choking. Also with dysphagia, the patient may re or client may require verbal coaching. For example, telling the client or patient to open their mouth. Ask, the, ask them if they feel the food in the mouth, chewing and tasting the food. You may also have the client or patient raise their tongue to the roof of the mouth to think about swallowing. Give them instructions to close your mouth, then swallow, and then swallow a second time, and also teaching them to cough to clear their airway. Again, at any time when you suspect dysphagia or the patient is having difficulty swallowing, you want to observe for choking, gagging, and drooling of food. For safety, you may want to have a suction device nearby. You want to also learn to provide rest periods during the meal to avoid rushed or forced feeding. Additionally, with patients that have dysphagia, they may have to use a thickener. There are four types of liquid, liquid thickener. A, thin liquid or low viscosity. B, nectar-like liquid, which is medium viscosity. C, honey-like liquid. And then spoon-thick liquid, such as pudding viscosity. You want to always feed slowly and allow the client to empty their mouth completely between feedings. And keep in mind that they may re require verbal coaching for each step in the process. So how are diets progressed? 
Clients with acute and chronic conditions affect, affecting the immune system may also affect nutritional status. These patients may require special diets to decrease exposure to microorganisms. Patients who have had prolonged illnesses, procedures, and are MPO or nothing by mouth for a period of time may need to have their diet progressed or advanced. Take a look at the slide and you will see the diet progression. NPO means absolutely nothing by mouth. Clear liquid diets include anything that is clear and liquid at room temperature. That could be broths, ginger ale, coffee, or tea. For the full liquid diet, that is anything that is liquid at room temperature. Ice creams, custards, and cooked cereal. Pureed. Examples are pureed meats and scrambled eggs. Mechanically softened diet includes the consistency of cottage cheese, rice, cooked fruits and vegetables, and bananas. Then you have the low or soft residue diet. This is, these are foods that are easily digested such as pastas, canned and cooked fruits and vegetables, and desserts without nuts or coconuts. You have the high residue or high fiber diet, which includes fresh, uncooked fruits, steamed veggies, bran, oatmeal, and dried fruits. Another diet is the low sodium. This is no added salt, and it's often called, called the severe sodium restriction, which is less than 500 milligrams. This is going to require that you teach your patient to re read food labels, the low sodium diet also is re often required for a patient who is hypertensive or who has kidney disease. You have the low cholesterol diet. This is a 300 milligram or less per day of cholesterol. Some examples of foods on a low cholesterol diet include oatmeal, fish where you get the omega-3 fatty acids, walnuts and olives, and olive oil. All of these help to reduce cholesterol. The diabetic diet. A recommended calorie count of 1800 calories with a balance of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. The gluten-free. This eliminates all wheat, oats, rye, barley, and their derivatives. And then lastly the regular diet which has no restrictions at all. Enteral tube feeding. This is where nutrients are given directly into the GI tract. This is used to meet the nutritional needs of patients have a functioning GI tract. There are three ways to receive enteral tube feedings. The nasal gastric tube, that is the tube that goes from the nose to the, to the stomach. The jejunal tube or just the gastric or peg tube. Gastric tubes are used to provide nutrition, but they and the patient has a low risk for gastric reflux. The gastric tubes are often inserted percutaneously or endoscopically. The PEG tube is the percutaneous enteral G tube. It is passed into the patient's stomach through the abdominal wall, most commonly to provide a means of feeding when oral intake is not adequate. The jejunal tube. The jejunal tube is extended into the small intestine by passing a jejunal extension tube or a PEG J tube through the PEG tube and into the jejunum. PEG is the preferred method if the patient is at high risk for gastric reflux. There are several different formulas that are utilized in enteral tube feedings. They include the polymetric, modular, modular M-O-D-U-L-A-R, elemental formulas, and specialty formulas. The poly polymetric tube feedings are milk-based, blenderized foods prepared by staff members at a facility or in home. They are commercially prepared as well. Some examples of polymeric tube formulas include Ensure or Osmolite. 
In order to receive these, the patient or client's GI tract must be able to absorb whole nutrients. The modular formula. These are singular macronutrient formulas. They include proteins, lipids, and polymers, and they are not nutritionally complete. These are added to other foods to meet the client's nutritional needs. Elemental formulas. These contain predigested nutrients that are easily that are easier for partially dysfunctional GI tracts to absorb. The elemental formula. And then lastly, the specialty formulas. They meet specific nutritional needs for particular illnesses. For example, pulmonary disease, liver disease, and HIV. With all tube feedings, you want to start at full strength but at a low rate. And we will discuss this in the lab. The hourly rate is increased every 8 to 12 hours per order and if there are no signs of intolerance that appear. You want to monitor patients on enteral tube feedings for aspiration. There's also tube feedings that are given as bolus or intermittent tube feedings, where the patient receives feedings at different intervals throughout the day, as well as the continuous tube feeding where the patient is hooked to a feeding pump and they receive feedings at a certain rate tw over 24 hours per day. If you take a look in your text, you will see information on feedings on page 1076, and we will review in class. Some complications of enteral tube feedings include aspiration, diarrhea, constipation, tube occlusion, tube displacement, delayed gastric emptying, and serum electrolyte imbalances. Please refer to Table 45-7 in your text on enteral tube feeding complications. We will next review the skill of inserting in a nasoenteric tube for enteral feeding. Please view the yellow pages in your text beginning on page 1085. Keep in mind that insertion of a tube will make the client gag. You will need to assess bowel sounds prior to placement. The absence of bowel sounds may indicate GI problems, thus it is contraindicated to feed the patient. You will also need to test gastric pH. You want to assess bowel sounds by listening in all four quadrants making sure that the head of the bed is at least 30 to 45 degrees to prevent aspiration. You will also check placement of the tube, feeding tube after placement and before starting every feeding. This is verified by x-ray or KUB. KUB stands for kidney, ureters, and bladder, a specific x-ray test. Gastric intestinal aspiration for pH is most accurate for placement after x-ray. Normal pH of gastric contents is 1.0 to 4.0, keeping in mind that pH is from 0 to 14. Anything 7, less than 7 is acidic, greater than 7 is alkalinic. The x-ray is going to be your most reliable method for confirming placement of your tube. If the patient or client complains of cramping, when they're receiving feedings, the first thing you need to do is decrease the rate or assess prior to feeding that the fluids are at least room temperature and not cold, as this will cause gastric cramping. Another way to check for placement of the tube is checking for residual, of this, and we will practice this in the lab. You will check placement of your enteral tubes via policy and procedure of the facility in which you are employed. When you aspirate stomach contents, you do not continue to feed if you have residual that exceeds 500 milliliters. Again, you do not continue feeding if gastric residual volume exceeds 500 milliliters. Also, when you check gastric residual, all of the food or the feeding that you pull out must be returned. This helps the client to remain 
in homeostasis or keep the fluid and electrolyte balance even. Tube feedings via the infusion pump. This is the way to provide continuous tube feedings to your client or patient. Continuous tube feedings are tube feedings that are always on a pump. You want to consult the doctor's order for the actual rate. However, it is usually between 40 and 60 milliliters per hour. It is good to maintain a constant rate and the tubing on the pumps is changed every 24 hours. Never discontinue a tube feeding suddenly as this may cause hypoglycemic reactions. You want to keep in mind to provide mouth care to your client at least every two hours if they are on continuous tube feedings. Parenteral nutrition. This is TPN, total parenteral nutrition. Complications of total parenteral nutrition include infection of the site, blood clots, a fatty liver, and often liver disease. You want to administer this to clients who are unable to digest or absorb enteral nutrition. This is provided intravenously through a central line, oftentimes a pick. You want to monitor the site, use de a dedicated port for a TPN. The central line goes into the subclavian or the vena cava vein. This placement is confirmed always by radiology prior to using the pick. These patients are at risk for an air embolism. You want to prevent air embolism by placing your patient on the left side and having them perform the Valsalva maneuver which is bearing down during the pick line insertion. You want to prevent occlusion of the pick by flushing with saline or heparin per facility policy. With the TPN, or TPN may also be known as a lipid emulsion or a fat emulsion. These generally run over 24 hours and contain kilocalories and help to prevent fatty acid deficiencies. Again, tubing and TPN should be changed every 24 hours. TPN may also increase blood glucose levels, so blood glucose must be monitored at least every 6 hours. TPN is administered at a constant rate. NG tube, chapter 47, for bowel elimination. NG tube or nasogastric intubation for decompression. This is the removal of secretions and gaseous substances from the GI tract or a relief of abdominal distension. The purpose of a nasogastric tube can be for enteral feedings, which is to install or place liquid nutrition inside. The NG tube can also be used for gastric lavage. This can cause irritation of the stomach in cases of active bleeding, poisoning, and gastric dilation. And also the NG tube can be used, or nasogastric intubation can be used as a gastric method of lavage. Gavage is the introduction of nutritive material into the stomach by means of a tube. There are a couple tubing types. The Salem sump or the two lumina tube, which we will see examples of in the lab. It is connected to a drainage bag or to intermittent suction. The Salem sump tube is connected to a drainage bag or intermittent suction. This tube is utilized for decompression, lavage, or gavage. Salem sump used for decompression, lavage, or gavage. One of the lumina removes gastric contents and is attached to suction, and the second lumina is an air vent, which is the blue pigtail on the tube. This provides free, continuous drainage of secretions. Never clamp off the air vent if the tube is connected to suction. Never clamp off the air vent if the tube is connected to suction. Connect it to suction or use it for irrigation. It is only for draining. Never clamp off the vent if the tube is connected to suction. Connect it to suction or use it for irrigation.
This tube is only used for drainage. The air vent tube is only used for drainage. The Levine tube or the single lumen tube is connected to a drainage bag or for intermittent suction. This can also be used for decompression, lavage, or gavage. Again, we will see examples of each in the lab and will practice insertion of the tube as well as removal of the tube. If you will look in the skills section of chapter 47, there will be the step-by-step -step process of inserting and maintaining a nasogastric tube for gastric decompression. These will also be practiced in the lab. Keep in mind, this does not require a sterile technique. Nasogastric tube insertion does not require sterile technique. Before beginning, you want to always assess vital signs. Insertion and maintenance takes place in the high Fowler's position. The best way to confirm placement is x-ray. However, aspiration of gastric contents and checking pH are other means of confirming placement. You want to measure drainage and record it as output. You measure the drainage for decompression nasogastric tubes and record it as output. You also want to remember to provide oral and nasal hygiene and care at least every two hours. Some complications for the nasogastric tube include distended abdomen, dry mucous membranes, skin breakdown around the nares, and also pulmonary aspiration. Signs and symptoms of pulmonary aspiration include fever, shortness of breath, and pulmonary decompression. Again, we will practice NG tube insertion and removal as well as care in the lab setting. This concludes Module 5 NG tube. If you have any questions, please notify your instructor.